Tonight's lecture features my good friend and colleague, Associate Curator Joe Zemla, and stems from an amazing new program we're launching called Living and Breathing, which I'm going to let him tell you about. And I think our educators attending tonight will be especially excited to learn about it. But for now, I just want to tell you how incredibly important Joe's recent archaeological discoveries are, given the rarity of remaining artifacts from the enslaved, particularly here in the North. It was Joe's curiosity and training that led him to investigate the possibility of further hidden remnants of the enslaved inhabitants of Marlpit Hall. And his discoveries are not only very important in the field, but have really taken MCHA to the next level. We'll be unveiling a new exhibit in the fall that reinterprets Marlpit with a focus on the enslaved. And as I hear about all of the amazing plans that they're making, I can already tell you that it's going to be a fascinating and eye-opening experience. And it really puts everything into perspective on so many levels. So please be on the lookout for announcements about the exhibit on our website and social media, because it's gonna be great. So without further ado, please welcome Joe Zemla. Hey, um, all right, let me just share the screen here. Okay. Okay, I think that's good, right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, so as Dana um, kind of mentioned, uh, tonight's talk about Marlpit Hall stemmed from an initiative from MCHA called Living and Breathing, um, which we started in January of 2020 as a way to reinterpret our, our four colonial era historic houses to in include the stories of the enslaved African Americans who lived and worked on these sites, um, as well as educate people about uh, educate the public about slavery in Mom County and its residual impact. Um, so this is the, uh, I want to say a special thank you to the Living and Breathing Advisory Committee, Linda Caldwell Epps, Rick Gefkin, Walter Greeson, Gilda Rogers, and Richard Veit. And many thanks to generous support of MCHA's Living and Breathing Project from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, New Jersey Historical Commission, and the PNC Foundation. So thank you so much. Okay, just give me one second here. Okay, so um, like I said, tonight's talk is about Marlpit Hall in particular. Uh, it's in Middletown, New Jersey. This is built around 1756. Here's a couple of shots of um, Marlpit. The one on the left there is around 1895 or so. Um, the one on the right is from present day. Um, and we attribute the building to either John Taylor or Barnabas Ryder. We're not exactly sure who built it. Um, it was built um, by one of the two, they both owned the land at some point in the 18th century. Um, and we know the house was purchased in 1771 by Edward Taylor. Um, and from that point on, we kind of um, have a better idea of, of uh, oops, sorry, better idea of the own, chain of ownership. Um, and uh, there we go. So in uh, just a little bit of revolutionary history for this house, in 1777, Edward was actually sentenced to home imprisonment at Marfitt for loyalist treason. Um, for the remaining decades, the house remained in the family until the death of Mary Holmes Taylor III, that was in 1931. Um, although since about the 1850s, it was mainly used as a rental to tenant farmers. Um, and Marlpa was actually moved at one point in 1919. So these two photos that you're looking at are actually in slightly different locations. It was only moved about one house length, and that was to make way for the, uh, the widening of King's Highway. And so that was in 1919. Uh, shortly after, it was purchased by Edna Netter and Margaret Riker Haskell and uh, sold to MCHA for restoration. Um, and very little changes have been made to the house since its construction. Um, so a lot of the, the original architecture is still intact. Uh, portions of the downstairs did need some extensive renovation when it was first purchased. Um, but a lot of the house still kind of contains its, its, uh, its bare bones there. Okay, uh, so like many 18th century farmers, the Taylors did have enslaved African Americans working on site. Um, and through documentation, we can name about 12 of them between 
1780 and, and around 1830, 1835. And uh, the primary evidence that we have for this is, of course, documentation, so, and so paper documents, um, as is virtually the entire record of, of colonial slavery. Um, and so this is valuable information, but unfortunately it comes at somewhat of a price. These records only reflect the perspective of, of white ownership. It's a very static view of slavery. There's virtually nothing that reflects the lives of the enslaved people who were living there. Um, so a couple examples on the left, we have an 1818 inventory of John Taylor, who was a resident of the home in Middletown. Um, and there's one, two, three, four uh, enslaved listed on that inventory up top. We also have an inventory of um, a room by room inventory, which is nice because it gives us an idea of what the house was furnished with back in, in the time. Um, and you can see in the bottom there, the kitchen chamber, which is the large loft right above the kitchen where the enslaved would stay. Um, we can kind of get a, a, an idea of the kinds of things that were in that room, beds, bedding, bedstead, um, straw beds, bedding, uh, some farm equipment, various ironware, stuff like that. Um, and then on the right, there's also from John Taylor, the farm ledger from Marlford Hall. This lists the births of um, Matilda, Elizabeth, and Will between the years of 1804 and 1806. Um, just to go a, a little bit broader for a second, uh, a lot of people are kind of surprised to learn that slavery was so widespread in New Jersey um, or in the North, and especially in New Jersey. Um, but you can see here the uh, black population in New Jersey since 1790 and looking especially at kind of the height of the Atlantic slave trade years between say 1790 and 1810. Um, there was roughly nearly 12,000, over 12,000 enslaved at one point um, populating New Jersey. So, and this was, uh, this was not completely eradicated until after the Civil War, which we'll uh, look at in just a second here. Um, this is a, narrowing it down just a little bit, the African American population of Monmouth County, 1784 to 1860. And uh, you can see kind of during that same early time period, there was uh, 50, at least 1,500 or more enslaved living just in Monmouth County per year. And if anything, these numbers are probably a little low because the documents did not always reflect um, honest numbers, uh, just based on uh, a couple of different reasons that um, I'll show you in just a second. And then finally, uh, breaking it down into the, um, the uh, townships that made up Monmouth County back in 1790s. You got Middletown, Upper Freehold, Freehold, Shrewsbury, Stafford, and Dover. Um, and in Middletown alone, there was close to 500 enslaved people just in 1790, which equates to about one in seven people at the time. Um, and slavery was not solely a practice of the rich and powerful. Uh, New Jersey relied heavily on farming and agricultural work. And, and so instead of the very large cotton and rice plantations of the South, New Jersey farmers kind of relied on smaller numbers of enslaved workers to help them on the farm. So um, those kind of envision, those pictures you see of the Southern plantations, very large plantations, lots of enslaved living there, um, kind of a different, different picture in the North, but, um, the institution itself was very similar. Um, so as I said, slavery was not officially eradicated until after the Civil War. Um, New Jersey was actually the last Northern state to abolish slavery and the process took many years. And so if you go all the way back to 1714, you see that there were New Jersey slave codes that declared that to manumit a slave to grant them freedom, you actually had to pay the cost of 200 pounds plus 20 pounds a year for life for the life of the slave to the government, which, uh, which was quite a hefty sum of money back in the day. Um, in 1786, New Jersey outlawed the importation of slaves from Africa, but they also said there was no free blacks allowed, no free blacks were allowed to move into the state. Uh, so by this time, generations of enslaved families were already established in the area and slavery was still considered a, a, um, an essential institution. In 1804, New Jersey passed what was called the Gradual Abolition Law, which created slaves for a term. Um, so this title sounds like a positive thing, abolition, but in actuality, it did very little for, the thousands, for thousands of enslaved people. So basically what it says was, was um, children born after July of 1804 were free, 
but they still had to serve their owners until the age of 21 if they were female or 25 if they were male. Slaves born prior to 1804 were still considered enslaved for life. So it's not very, um, not a, a true abolition law as the title might suggest. Okay, in 1844, New Jersey Constitu Constitution declares, this is the second New Jersey Constitution, declares all men are, are, are by nature free and independent until the courts declared that this provision only applied to white men. So again, no help for the enslaved people of New Jersey. In 1846, New Jersey law abolishes slavery with the caveat that except the um, current slaves must serve their owners as apprentices for life unless they were able to buy their freedom. And you can imagine that in 1846, this was a highly unlikely scenario that an unpaid uh, worker could by their freedom, but nevertheless, this was the, uh, the law. Okay, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation did not free any slave, slaves in New Jersey, but it did provide for the establishment of the United States Colored Troops. So some of the uh, enslaved men were able to go fight in the war for the Union Army. Um, and at least 35 African Americans were, would be awarded the Medal of Honor for their service during the Civil War. And finally, in 1865, the 13th Amendment frees the approximately 16 remaining slaves in New Jersey. So again, making New Jersey the last of the Northern states to completely abolish slavery. Um, okay, so that's kind of an overview of New Jersey. Going back to Middletown specifically, um, I kind of said before how the documentation provides us with, with a lot of the information on the enslaved, but the records are highly one-sided and they were created primarily for economic reasons. So this is a kind of a good example of, of a bias in slavery records. This is called the 1798 Federal Slave Tax List of Middletown. Um, it's one of the very few lists that provides for a total number of slaves. Um, and it also provides for exemptions and those subject to taxation. So you can see I highlighted John Taylor towards the bottom there. Um, if you go over uh, to the total column, John Taylor owned six, is cited as having six slaves here in Middletown. Four of them were exempt, and exempt at the time included females, males under 16, males over 50, the disabled, or anyone physically unfit for work. So what it came down to was only two of them were subject to taxation. So someone who technically had six enslaved residents at his house would show up on the tax rateables year after year as having maybe one or two. Um, so again, this document gives you a little bit more truth behind the numbers because if you go through those tax rateables of the late 18th century, early 19th century, the numbers are very low. So you get a very skewed sense. And even some of these you can see up top, um, John, John Smock Farmer, uh, nine total enslaved, six of them were exempt, meaning females, maybe under 16, males over 50. So three would show up on the tax rateables or in census um, for that year. Um, so of the 12 or so identified enslaved at Marfoot Hall, uh, one is Elizabeth Van Cleef. She was born to her mother, Hannah, in 1806. Um, and you can see up top there, from that's another little snippet of the farm ledger from John Taylor. And this photograph is from the album of Mary Holmes Taylor, who resided at the Orchard Home Mansion, also known as the Taylor Butler House, and you may have, have been there. It's also an MCHA-owned home in Middletown. Um, it was built in 1853 on the same property as Marlpit, just across the way there. Um, so Elizabeth was actually manumitted, uh, freed around 1830 or so, but she ended up staying with the Taylor family as a domestic servant for most of her life. And um, this may sound like kind of a strange decision, you know, she was granted her freedom, yet she stayed with the Taylor family. But if you look back, it's a pretty common phenomenon. Um, some of these people would stay as, as domestic servants and they were paid or, or paid at least with, in some form, maybe as somewhere to live. But um, so like I said, it sounds like a strange decision, but when there was, these people had nowhere to go, they often had no money, they had, might have children to provide for. So um, sometimes it was the only option. And uh, you can see the uh, 1883 obituary there in the Matawan Journal for Elizabeth and states right there that once a slave in one of the Taylor families near Middletown and the expenses of the burial were paid by the family. 
Um, if you look at any of the 18th, 19th century newspapers of New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, um, you'll see that they're littered with these runaway slave ads. And these are another kind of documentation we use to, to um, pinpoint the various enslaved who lived at, at homes all across New Jersey um, and elsewhere. And so these ads, they still are kind of a reflection as people, as property, as you can see. I mean, some, someone who's owned by another human being and runs away and, and the owner is trying to retrieve them, basically. Um, but in, in a sense, the, the uh, runaway ads are the only one types of documentation that in some manner humanize the enslaved. So uh, many times what you'll see is a name. So this one is for Will, age 23 years. Um, you see physical features, clothing, particular skills are often listed. Um, so you, you kind of get a little bit of a snapshot as opposed to just a number on an inventory. This one is from Middletown. It's from John Taylor. Um, based on what we know, I don't think this is the John Taylor who resided in Middletown, but it was very likely a related Taylor who lived nearby in Middletown. Um, ironically, this is from the Freeman's Journal of Philadelphia, 1787. Um, typically, it's very hard to find out what happened to these runaways. Um, this one in particular, there was an, a 1785 ad, runaway ad for the same person, Will. So this was actually the second time that he had attempted to run away. And, and this is, that's the last of the story that we know, which is very common. We typically don't know whether the person made it to freedom or was re retrieved and brought back to their owner. Um, and, but what the, the, um, the ads do is it, it also, in addition to kind of showing that humanization, it um, reflects the bravery of, of the individuals who really risked everything to gain their freedom. As this was um, an extremely dangerous thing to attempt. I mean, this, they, there was not only uh, a bounty on them, but just to be a, a runaway a black man in 1787 um, was a very, very dangerous thing to, to do. So it kind of shows you the motivation they had for, for running away. This is Marlpit Hall today. Um, and this is the kitchen area. Um, like I said, this was, there's a lot of the, the original architecture in the home. Um, and on the right there is the, are the, the stairway, kind of the winding stairway that leads up to the, the former slave quarters. And um, this is a very common feature of, of, um, of these colonial houses that did hold enslaved people um, to have the stairway right up, right in, up from the kitchen into their quarters because m much of the time they were working down in the kitchen. So it was kind of a convenient little um, a wing of the house here. Um, going up those steps, this is the view you would get, and the, um, this is this portion of the house is it's the right above the kitchen. It's largely unrenovated. There's very little that's changed since it was built in what we think was 1756, maybe 1760. Um, you'll see a few modern improvements. There's lighting, there's some heating ducts, things like that. Uh, HVAC system for preservation. But other than that, the brickwork, the wood, uh, the lathing, a lot of it is really that kind of um, 18th century architectural fabric. So um, in a way, this was it makes for a good study tool because while some of the other portions of the house have kind of been um, renovated over time and such, uh, this particular room remains as is. Here's another shot um, looking towards the, the uh, on the right there where that little gate is, where that stairway was, is a, a shot of the big, thick uh, chimney stack there in the center. And one more shot, this is, if you looked over there, there's kind of a, a sub-level. Um, it's possible that at one point there was a partition or a wall there. We're not exactly sure um, what the original configuration was, but you can uh, see how it does go up a few feet. There's a little tiny stairwell there. Okay, so uh, when we're talking in the context of slavery, we're speaking primarily about the western coast of Africa, where a large majority of the roughly 12 million Africans were forced into slavery through the transatlantic slave trade. So on the right there's a little map of shows the most prevalent regions from where those Africans were taken from. Um, and one of the ones that we'll look at most closely is that West Central Africa region. Um, the, and which includes the uh, 
the old Congo kingdom, and we'll take another look at that in just a second, but you can see that quote on the left, um, the African-American archeology span for definition, according to Teresa Singleton, is the use of material culture to interpret African-American life. So kind of a uh, simple but fitting definition of African-American archeology. span and this was a field that it was practically actually non-existent until maybe the 1960s or 1970s when the field grew, um, thanks to things like historical uh, preservation legislation, activism movements, um, and the increased use of archaeology in public interpretation of history. Um, the first excavation of slave quarters was not until about 1968. So again, this was this is really a fairly modern um, field. And much of this took place in the South, um, especially early on. The primary goals were, were really seeking information on living conditions, foodways, things of that nature. Um, like I said, on Southern plantations, sometimes at the sites of former slave cabins. Um, a large majority of those are long gone, but sometimes the sites were excavated. And basically what the archeologists did was look for pattern recognition. So they, and which is very good for categorizing objects based on function. So, cookware, um, you know, living utensils, things like that, you can kind of get a good idea of what people used in their living quarters. Um, what it doesn't do is give you much information on anything in terms of um, cultural, cultural aspects, spirituality, religion. So um, again, kind of those different um, aspects of, of the more personal lives. Um, so the excavations, as they did more and more of these excavations, uh, they began to reveal much more. Um, objects were turning out that didn't quite fit that standard categorization. Um, and once this started to become kind of a repeated phenomena, uh, the focus started shifting to, to looking at African-American retention. So what, what was retained from during the transatlantic slave trade? and expressions of things like cultural identity, spirituality, and really a reflection of, of how these people were adapting their living to their own preferences, um, instead of just kind of being forced into a new lifestyle. Um, so these are some of the things that were turning up uh, at sites, slavery sites all over the country, really, and elsewhere. Uh, assemblages here are found in New York, Kentucky, Maryland, Virginia, kind of these um, unexplained, in terms of function, objects like shells, beads, pierced coins, bones, glass, ceramic shards, often found together in groupings and often in the same types of areas, um, primarily concealed in doorways, hearths, windows, places that were thought that um, unwanted spirits could enter. And uh, so these were things that at one point had a standard purpose, but were now being reclaimed and used for another purpose. So this kind of led, modified traditions lent themselves to the ideas and beliefs that, um, of African belief systems that for a long time were thought to not have survived the uh, slave trade. So um, eventually the kind of a convergence of archeology, span anthropology, um, African-American culturalists, oral histories, all those started to converge and the shift started to focus to study of tangible evidence of African heritage, specifically West African spirituality. So you can see again there on that map, the, uh, the Kingdom of Congo, which was established um, around 1390 AD, and that's shown over present day boundaries. Um, and from there stems a lot of the traditional African religions. So the ethnic religions, which are believed to be the oldest belief systems in Africa, prior to any conversion to Christianity or Islam. Um, so you can see on the left there, the Congo Cosmogram, which is a representation of the continua, con continuity of life and provides a locus for communication between the spirit world of the ancestors and the world of the living. Uh, so it, it's kind of referred to as a mapping um, and the main, um, one of the main features of it is, is a distinction but a continuous cycle between the, the lands of the living and the dead. Um, so ancestors and kind of that communication of the living and the ancestors. Um, so culture, like I said, 3000 plus tribes and cultures. So religious and spiritual beliefs do vary from place to place. This is only one example of the Congo Cosmogram, 
although it did the Congo Kingdom had quite a large influence along the whole coast there. Um, so beliefs varied, but many of the similarities found in these um, ancient African religions were things like oral traditions, a strong reverence for nature, uh, the ancestors and spirit worlds, uh, belief in the afterlife, and like the cosmogram there represents the continuous cycle of life between the worlds of the living and the dead. Robert Farris Thompson, 1983, wrote um, kind of a groundbreaking book in the field called Flesh of the Spirit. So identifies um, African and Afro-American Afro art and philosophy from multiple cultures. And he goes into a lot of the things, um, descriptions of things that, that explain some of the things that were turning up these uh, sites of, of slavery. Um, so that was kind of a, one of the uh, premier books that kind of went into all this, um, the African retention from the, during the slave trade. Um, so he, one of the things he talks about is um, Nkisi from the Congo kingdom there, and which is material objects that contain spiritual powers. They're built and used for protection, for healing, divination. So again, things that are common in a lot of these African religions. They were thought to manipulate the environment to ward off evil and to even communicate with the ancestors. So um, obviously that's a very brief little uh, synopsis of, of what the book is, and but uh, it does it goes into much greater detail and kind of starts to explain some of those unexplained phenomena that were turning up at the archaeology sites. Kind of a modern day interpretation of that cosmogram, a sculptor named Houston Conwell, uh, it's called the Rivers Cosmogram, and he used it as a mapping of the African diaspora as a memorial and also as a memorial to um, two influential Harlem Renaissance figures. Langston Hughes and Arturo Afonso Schomburg. And this is, it's one, main, one of the main gallery floors of the Schomburg Research Center for Black Culture, which is located in Harlem, New York. So, okay, going back to Marlpit Hall in Middletown, um, somewhere around 1999 or so, there was some renovation being done upstairs near the slave quarters and then the workers found a, a clamshell and a corn cob. These were discovered, we believe, underneath the doorway that, and that doorway there is the one that leads to the, the former slave quarters there. Um, and, the, and so there was speculation right away that they're, given the proximity of these objects, that this was something to do with some kind of African religious beliefs of the enslaved there. Um, so at the time, you know, there was only these two objects. There wasn't too much to go on just yet. Uh, kind of coincidentally, around the same time, at the Lot House in Brooklyn, 1719 Dutch farmhouse, um, they made a major discovery in this house. They, they actually, in addition, before they found any artifacts or anything, they uncovered the, the slave quarters themselves. These were hidden for over 200 years in a concealed attic, um, so no one had, had been up there. They didn't even know these quarters. They knew that the, the lots had owned slaves, but they did not know that these quarters existed in the house until they found them after one or two years of, of research. Um, so of course they did, they started renovating the slave quarters and, and they found many of the same things that were found um, at those other, southern sites. So they were finding caches of shells and bones and things wrapped in cloth similar to the Congo and Kisi. Um, on the right there, corn cobs arranged purposefully, theoretically purposefully to represent cosmogram or some form of the cross mark symbol. Um, 2001, the New York Times Magazine did an article on this and um, they cited these findings as significant proof that African spiritual practices had, contrary to prior beliefs, survived the period of slavery, not only in the Deep South, but as far north as New York City. So for many, many, many years, no one really believed that these practices had even survived to the, to the, uh, the New World. Um, then the belief kind of shifted to, okay, now there's these discoveries in the South are kind of pinpointing, okay, maybe maybe some of these retention, retentions did survive. Now, this was kind of the first major Northern discovery that said um, there was something here that had to do with this African spirituality. Um, so this, about a year ago, this is when I kind of find it started looking around for things in Marl Pit. I, I, I want to say one of the only good things about this um, pandemic was that it gave a lot of us time to kind of embark on projects that we wouldn't normally be able to do when, when the museum is open or the houses are operating. So um, 
you know, we knew that the, the corn cob and the clamshell were found at the house um, in the specific location in the doorway, which kind of gave us an inkling that something might be going on here. Um, it wasn't quite enough yet just to go on, but um, first thing I came across was this additional corn cobs and clamshells. These were found beneath the floorboards in Marl Pit, um, right around that same doorway. And you can see this is actually, very, it looks a little bigger than it is. It's a very small area, about one foot by a foot wide there. Um, and these were very likely, while the objects themselves are a little unusual, they um, could have well been displaced because, uh, like I said, it's a very small and accessible area. So um, finding the objects was kind of another little clue, but uh, they, it didn't give us much to go on just yet. Um, when I started taking a deeper look into the slave quarters themselves, that's when much more started kind of arising. Um, this, if you look on the left there, that right where that wood partition meets the hearth, there's, there was about a foot or so of empty space by now covered in crack brick and dirt and some other stuff. Um, when I went through that, and I was kind of limited here to looking at places that were First of all, accessible to me. I mean, I wasn't about to go in and start you know, knocking down walls or anything of that sort. So only places I could get at. But I did kind of ha have that idea that, um, you know, like I said before, there were certain areas to, to look at it, places like the uh, doorways, windows, hearths. Um, so sure enough, in this little area here, with this entire cache of ceramic shards, clamshells, painted glass fragments, little jaw bones on the right there, these were all found together. Um, Kind of within that maybe I don't know an area about a foot wide, and these and this whole cache as a whole started resembling a lot of those ones that I showed you earlier on. Um, uh, bones was another big um, uh, uh, finding there uh, when I started looking under some of the floorboards. You can see up left there that little vertebrae we think belongs to maybe a sheep or a cow. Um, of course, finding bones in an 18th century farmhouse in and of itself is not entirely unusual, but um, these were, the ones you see here were all concealed. They were either in their, under the floorboards. A few of them were, like I said, mixed in with that little cachet of ceramics and such. Um, I, I am, at first didn't know too much about the significance, but when you, I kind of started researching and led me to a lot of those, um, the WPA slave narratives. You can find them on the Library of Congress and, and just a bunch of old um, articles written by different archeologists and anthropologists. And um, and did find that these bones oftentimes represented things like those uh, protection charms. Um, so they were either worn as personal adornments or kind of put together as a little cachet, one of those spirit charms. Um, most of these uh, were found uh, separately, except for the the uh, like I mentioned, a few of them found together in that little uh, cachet with the other objects. Um, when I started looking into some of the brickwork, the wood lathing, again, that old kind of architectural fabric. Um, these were kind of neat to find. These were, uh, and these were all since identified as very late 18th or very early 19th century um, historic garment uh, pieces. So you can see some corduroy fabric there up on the left, and then some swatches of, of cloth or cotton. Um, so we don't have a specific date for these, but these were, um, concealed into the, in the wall itself. So within the brick and the lathing, these were kind of crumbled into the wall. Here's another cl little closer look at the, um, it's a closer look at that tiny corduroy strip. And what we found right away that is, I'm not sure you can see it here, but it, uh, at the top, there's a, a very small buttonhole um, on this strip. And it was identified as, if you look on the right there, that, um, those very common breaches of the of the time around 1800. That swatch there at the bottom, that circle, that's what these here are. And, um, you know, interestingly, if you read a lot of those runaway ads that I was showing before, uh, very, very often you'll see this kind of description of wearing brown uh, corduroy breeches. Um, it's a lot of, it kind of fits the same description. And these were also found in, within the, the slave quarters. So the significance is unknown, of course. Um, it's very possible, you know, the, the, with meager rations, things were being kind of hidden away for future use, to make use of, uh, reuse of things. Um, one theory is that these, these some of these do rip, um, kind of 
mimic the that Congo in Kisi, which is again that kind of spiritual charm that were devised in in West African religions to uh, for protection and healing, communication with the ancestors. So on the left there, from Thompson's book, Flesh the Spirit, that's an example of uh, 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 Kisi from the Bakongo tribe of West Africa. Uh, recorded ra raffia cloth. It's unwrapped to show you what was inside of it. Many times these were filled with organic materials, um, shell, anything from shells, fingernails, herbs, um, natural things that were that had great spiritual significance. Um, and in fact, at the lot house that I mentioned earlier, they found several of these small pouches tied together with um, actual objects still intact. This concealed cloth fabric discovered at Marpet on the right. Um, at this point, unfortunately, if it contained anything, it has long since disintegrated. Uh, one of our hopes for this is actually to, to do some uh, DNA testing on these fabric samples. To, and what they can do is kind of tell you if anything organic was in here, give you a better idea as to the date, what might have been um, wrapped in this. So um, for now, this stands as kind of just one possible theory. But um, like I said, being concealed in the area that it was within the slave quarters, uh, it does kind of raise that question. Here's a sh shot of some of the floorboards that were taken up near the chimney. This room is actually not in a slave quarter as I showed before. This is a, a smaller room opposite, which we frankly have no real idea of what it was used for. It's for many, many years now. It's just kind of been a storage room. So it's quite possible that this was a, a, another small uh, enslaved, enslavement area for where the uh, enslaved resided. We're not entirely sure. Um, one of the kind of odd things about this was that when you take up the floorboard, you know, you kind of expect to see a little layer of dirt or, or wood or whatnot, but there's just a ton of um, space under there, a ton of empty space. You can see on the left, that's about two boards lifted up, and then on the right, that kind of thick beam running, running across. And um, that's like maybe a good, it's over an arm, arm's length down, a couple feet down of that brick, and sometimes uh, in other sections of the house, it, you can kind of see framework for for lower uh, lower story cabinets and such. Uh, this particular room was kind of unusual. It's just a lot of kind of empty space. Um, but this was one of the more exciting discoveries because, like I said before, we did find the corn cobs and shells earlier, but with real no uh, no real significance just yet. I mean, it was an inkling, but there was nothing tangible to go on. So these corn cobs were were seemingly arranged purposefully. Um, and again, you see that cross mark pattern beneath the floorboards. And I just want to show you. Okay, so there on the left, I, I mentioned the lot house discovery, the corn cobs. Um, and that was in the area that the slave quarters that were undisturbed for maybe 200 years or so. So when they pulled up the floorboards, that was the formation of the, uh, the corn cobs. And again, going back to that, that cosmogram and or the cross marks, which is a very uh, widespread sign in the African diaspora multiple or origins across many African cultures, um, kind of represents uh, like, just like the, the cosmogram, the, that intersection of visible and invisible worlds. Sometimes you'll see it as just referred to as an X, the crossroads, the four points um, can be used for protection rituals, and, uh, interplay of uh, spirit worlds. But it was kind of striking how similar these, these two uh, arrangements were. Another example of these cross marks, this was on the door into the slave quarters. There's kind of these two thick beams, there's one on top, one on the bottom, these boards, wooden boards going across. And these are faint, but if you look closely, there's on each board right in the middle, there's an incised uh, cross mark. And this quote here, the cross, crossroads are an extremely important symbol among a large number of the over 2,000 cultures in West Africa that contributed people to the slave trade. And that was uh, Kenneth Brown from the University of Houston, and he was one of the lead excavators at the Levi Jordan Plantation in Brazoria County, uh, Texas. So again, there's another shot, if you look closely, that um, very, very faint, size cross marks um, uh, uh, comes up across various cultures and beliefs, um, and stemming from that Congo area and beyond. So the cosmogram is kind of that um, some people believe it's a shortened shorthand of that cosmogram. Others believe that it, that this there's no real pinpointing this sign to any specific African culture. It's so widespread. 
Um, this was very unusual. This was in the other room um, above the doorway. These are a little different because they're, they're obviously not quite as um, discreet, I want to say. Um, it's an unusual pattern. Now, a lot of these old houses, it's not uncommon to find maker, uh, not like um, carpenter marks. So if people are, when joists and things are, are connected, the carpenter used to dig a little um, a mark or Roman numeral into the two pieces to kind of keep his bearings. Um, but those are pretty easily recognized. They're usually, you know, uh, dug out deeper, they're, they're neater, and you can kind of have a feeling for where they're going to be. So something like this is um, a little more unexplained. Um, so you can see across the top there, there's some, some of them are more slashes, some of them are X's. Um, I had a pretty long conversation with a, a cultural anthropologist who specializes in African American diaspora from uh, William and Mary, and she was pretty fascinated by these um, signs and had a couple theories. She, because it again is in this doorway, uh, representing an entrance or an exit, um, it was a good pointed to a good possibility of this being used as a, a kind of a spiritual practice to, to ward off uh, evil spirits or some kind of protection. Um, another possibility is, is gaming tallies, uh, like you, perhaps these were just tallies for, for, for playing a game. They, they could be just um, kind of an odd shaped um, marks from construction on the door at some point. So we're not exactly sure, but it kind of lends itself to, again, that whole exploration of all this, this uh, cultural retention. Um, this is a little bit off topic, but I just th thought this was kind of neat. These were... Um, these are not Marple Hall. These are 17th century, uh, what they're called witch marks. So the uh, colonial Europeans used to carve these into um, into the wood in, in Europe and New England, kind of during that witch hysteria, um, in addition to other other um, traditions like shoes and walls. Uh, sometimes they put mummified cats in walls, things like that to ward off witches. A lot of similarities um, in, in, in the fact that these are found in areas like the around fireplaces, entrances, exits. Um, so they're called ap apotropaic or witch marks. They're commonly carved into wooden beams. There's, I mean, these are just a few. There's entire uh, glossaries or dictionaries dedicated to these. But um, and in fact, in 2015 at the Queen's House in the Tower of London, um, when they were doing work there, they discovered more than 80 of these, these witch marks carved into the, the beams. Some more examples of that cross mark from the, um, these were from various uh, sites of enslavement across the South, um, a couple up north in New York there, but uh, Kentucky, South Carolina. So in addition to those caches of objects, uh, archeologists were discovering things that were incised with this X mark or the cross mark. Um, bowls, pottery, spoons, all kinds of things. There's another uh, bottom left there from the lot house that we talked about in New York. Uh, on the right, a spoon and a coin from Kentucky. So this became a very common phenomenon to see this, this cross mark um, turn up at, not only in theory, but actually incised onto these objects. And this is a mark that dates uh, a long way back, um, again, back to the, uh, the old African religions uh, all the way on the left there, 14th century rock art in the lower Congo region. Uh, 17th century Kingdom of Congo flag was actually that cross mark. And the right, 20th century sculpture of a mother and child. This is, it's not the clearest picture, but there's, uh, if you look at a lot of um, modern um, African sculptures and art, you see similar to along the bottom uh, rim there, the, the series of X's all around the, uh, the, the band there. So it's a common mark that continues to show up even today. Um, um, just a few more examples on the right, uh, houses across various areas still crossed, the, uh, crossing, uh, crossing the, the um, sometimes they say crossing the road, cr crossing the door, you know, just as a, a way of protecting themselves. Um, on the left is an illustration from a, a poem called Signs, Daniel uh, Webster Davis, a little before 1900 there. Um, and this was kind of a, a depiction of, a, of an African, Af affluent African American woman, um, kind of with a, a struggling with a double uh, consciousness and, and um, retaining African beliefs that she kind of didn't even know she had retained. But uh, that cross mark again is evident in the ground there. She 
um, cross makes a cross mark um, in the ground. Uh, on the left, the tomb of the Voodoo Queen Marie Laveau in uh, New Orleans, and this is a, a tomb that, unfortunately, I guess for the groundskeepers, gets painted over and defaced time after time after time uh, with these same markings. Um, the, the old lore is that people come and um, well, well, make a wish and add their cross, and I think the if they if the wish comes true, they have to come back and, and cross it again, something along those lines. But um, again, you can see this, this sign is so widespread among uh, for for centuries, really. And then, of course, on the right, bluesman Robert Johnson at the crossroads, Clarksdale, Mississippi, and uh, the old story there where he um, came to a crossroads in his life, sold his soul to the devil for his musical talent, and uh, I guess the rest is is history there. But um, uh, one of the things you'll see if you start once you start reading about kind of these religions and especially the, the feature that may have um, kind of retained through throughout the African diaspora is you see it referred to as hoodoo. And um, I mean, this is kind of a whole nother topic on its own, but I just want to touch on it real quick because um, I, when I first started reading about it, it can be confusing because, you know, a lot of you have probably seen hoodoo, um, you know, if you, especially if you go down to places like New Orleans and kind of this what they call the modern or contemporary hoodoo complex. Um, uh, so it's this distinction here on the screen is, is really on the left, the traditional African American hoodoo versus on the right, the modern snake oil complex. And that's from a book, a really, really fascinating book uh, called Mojo Working by Katrina Hazard Donald, written in 2013. So you see on the left there, the traditional black belt hoodoo complex entails things like midwives, um, morticians, grave diggers, spiritualists, conjurers, root workers, um, so mojos, charms, uh, things like that. You'll see them ca called all sorts of things. Uh, over time, this kind of became uh, exploited into the more modern complex um, where you see this kind of uh, market marketeers, curio shops, snake oils. You can see even on the packaging there, they, they retain some of the original there's that cross mark, but they're selling on the right there, you know, Jinx Maker, Crystal Salt. So uh, just kind of making that important distinction. It, sometimes it sounds um, dismissive to say hoodoo, but it's uh, there's quite a large uh, difference here between the two. Um, so the, the actual definition of the traditional hoodoo is more of a, a, an herbal healing, it's supernatural controlling of, of the spiritual world. Um, more of a folk tradition than anything amongst African American traditions in the um, United States. And um, like music, like dance, it's an evolving form. It's kind of adapted to the environment. So um, some of these practices are actually mixed with uh, those of Native Americans, even uh, white Europeans. Um, so, you know, when, as these the enslaved came over from Africa, certain things were retained, other things had to be kind of modified to, to their new uh, environments, of course. Um, hoodoo does sound like voodoo. They're not exactly the same. Uh, they're kind of looked at as distant cousins, so stemming from that same West African practice, but um, not not quite the same thing. Um, and sorry, just looking. For, um, so hoodoo is often thought of as kind of a, a veiled resistance or uh, to enslavement. So this was a way for the African Americans who were transported through the slave trade to kind of um, retain their culture and, and, and use their spirituality and their, their rituals in a way that was not, um, that was concealed really. It was a form of concealment, form of resistance. Um, okay, and this final slide here, it's a real short video, but again, I just want to emphasize kind of the meaning of the, uh, I think it's important to emphasize that a lot of this stuff, it, it wouldn't be fair to, to just say that these are, um, you know, African practices that came over and mixed with with uh, white colonial practices. There's a very clear kind of distinction that retains that Africanism. And um, let me just play this and this is, it'll explain it a little bit better. Let me start this piece by stating my stance on the Huru tradition. It has always been and will always be an African practice. The amalgamation of diverse West African cultures that were forced to work together against the common enemy is at the very core 
root and fruit of root work and kanja. To oversimplify it into a combination of African, Native American, and European concepts is misleading and unfair to the legacy of the practice. Kanja and root work was our natural way brought with us during the transatlantic slave trade. It served as a protection for slaves suffering all manner of abuse and trying to find a way to cope with their unfortunate circumstances. Yes, African slaves did come in contact with Native Americans and took pieces from their traditions because they knew of herbs that were unfamiliar to us since we were used to working with different natural items. Yes, after World War I, Europeans moldied their culture vulture assets over to our practice to add in and take away, but nothing of their influence bears witness to any claim they can make of adding anything of significance to Hulu besides the Psalms and use of the Bible, which is a forced inclusion into the heritage of root work that we had already created. Okay, um, so really I just wanted to end by saying that um, all these things that I showed you that were found at Marple kind of resembling up the other sites, um, uh, it's, it's really exciting in the, in the way that um, it's one of the first times it, it, that these types of things are turning up in these northern sites and it's so rare to find any evidence of enslavement at any site really just because of, of um, so many of the sites don't exist and things were discarded or, or ignored over the years but um, like I said there's no this is all still ongoing research but I think what I took most from this is that the importance of the, the approach. So um, we can't say for certainty that these objects have the meaning that we're saying, but just by adopting this new philosophy into kind of researching slavery, not just from a historical perspective, but um, you know, converging with archaeologists, anthropologists, um, the African American culturalists, all these different fields to kind of stop treating slavery is a static uniform institution because the stories are so different at, at any given site and um, irrelevant of the artifacts that are uncovered. It's just um, the historians are, are seeking new ways to shed lights on the, on the lives of the enslaved from the perspective of the enslaved, which I think is goes back to those first few slides I showed of the, the, that sort of one-sided view of enslavement. So. Um, so I think a lot of important steps have been taken. Um, I, I don't mean just here, but just throughout, from which is really good from a historical perspective. And I think it will be important to keep that momentum going and kind of unfold those stories as we continue to, to branch out and look for new um, interpretations. And hopefully that's what we'll be doing at MCHA with our historic houses. And I think Dana mentioned in October, we're hoping to open up an exhibit on uh, enslavement at Marquette Hall and, and Middletown nearby, um, which will encompass Middletown and New Jersey. So um, we'll definitely keep you all posted on that. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now or via email or, or whatever. So I'm going to end this here. Okay. Hang on one second. No problem. Okay, that was great, Joe. Thanks. Um, yeah, it really gives Malpit a whole different sort of personality to to uh, hear about who lived there prior. Um, before we get to the question and answer session, can I know a lot of you are going to have a lot of questions. Um, I just want to mention and remind you about our upcoming presentation by Gary Sarevsky. Gary is doing his lecture on the Pop Brothers photography with a focus on Gustavus Pop. And uh, the images, if you haven't seen them already, uh, they're just amazing because these men were capturing history without even realizing it. Just very everyday kind of images, but they're fascinating because many of the details within them are just things that are completely lost to time. So that's gonna be a good one. We're really looking forward to that. Um, and now we will take some questions for Joe. Hang on, let's see, what have we got? Is Malpit open for tour? And if not, um, do we have an estimate about when it will open? Um, currently, no, unfortunately. Uh, typically, the season is uh, spring and summer, but because of the pandemic, we've, we were forced to close down. And um, we're still, there's still a lot of, to do in terms of kind of reopening. But um, and from now, moving forward, there's going to be some work done there for the upcoming exhibit. But um, you know, there's always, if, if anyone's interested in the house, there's, you can give a call and, you know, hopefully we can set something up, maybe 
private or group term, uh, tour if it's available. It just kind of depends on the, the circumstances, I guess, which I know is not a great answer, but <laughs> we would, uh, you know, love to see, see people there. I'm laughing because somebody just sent us a message for Joe's xylophone. <laughs> <laughs> that's a new one. Yeah. That's, a, that's a new one. Um, hmm. Were any slaves buried on the Merle Pitt property? Uh, not that we know of, no. Um, in fact, we don't really know where too many of them, not just the Marl Pit, but in general, in the area were, were buried. Um, some, were, some were, you can kind of find in the records, others um, in, um, it, it, when they were marked by gravestones, they, they were kind of meager wooden markers, of, which have long since deteriorated. So. Um, I think the one I showed before, um, the marker, uh, or not the marker, but the obituary of Elizabeth Van Cleef, who was buried in, uh, in Matawan. Uh, so she was, at, at that point, living elsewhere. But um, I, I also don't think any of the enslaved people, um, well, at that time, had, had died at Marvel. I'm not sure about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, here's a good question. Did you rule out that the food items, such as the corn cobs and the bones, may have been the result of rats dragging those items into the concealed areas? Yeah, no, I mean, not at all. When if, like I said, when the, the corn cob and, and the clamshell, I mean, it, it alone were not, um, these, they, the corn cob was something, the only other really thing that I've seen about the corn cob was at the, the lot house when they were kind of configured as that uh, cross mark. Uh, the clamshells I did see at many sites turning up in, in the var various um, charms or spiritual pouches. But like I said, when the ones we found, I'm, I wasn't here in the 90s when they found those. Um, so I'm not exactly sure uh, the whole story. But um, some of the ones we found, yeah, were, were almost um, definitely uh, mis over, over time got moved. I mean, like I said, the house was moved. Could have been rodents. We don't know. Um, just finding them in the context of the slave quarters was unusual because they really don't turn up anywhere else that we know of in the house. Um, but really the first time that it seemed like really pointed to something significant was seeing that pattern that so closely resembled that uh, the, the uh, purposeful thing at the lot house. It's a placement. Yeah. Um, and are there slave quarters in any of our other houses? Um, yeah, well, okay, Taylor Butler House is the only one of the five that we own that um, do not have slave quarters. It was built in 1853. Um, so, but as far as the colonial era houses, obviously Marl Pitt, uh, Copenhagen and Freehold, uh, there is that same kind of area above the kitchen. Um, we don't know for sure, but they're presumed that the enslaved lived there. It's a little different there because like so many other sites, that house has been kind of gutted and renovated so many times over the years by various owners. Um, that's what really makes Marlpit so unique and so significant is that we are looking at the slave quarters as we would be looking at them, you know, in 1800, other than those few modern um, things that I had talked about. But um, Allen House uh, in Shrewsbury, there's that, that portion over the kitchen. Um, and uh, which one? Uh, Holmes Hendrickson House in uh, Homedale. Um, yes, there's there's definitely enslavement quarters there, and which kind of a neat feature about those is if you go up in, in that stairway into the slave quarters, there's that the old original wooden railing, and the railings of the walls, it's obviously all wood, and on that railing, there's a portion of it at the top, and you put your hand on it, it's polished down hard like stone, just because of years, decades, centuries of hands running over them, so you can really just feel the thousands of times that probably for the most part enslaved people ran their hands down those wooden railings. So it's really kind of a special thing to have in, in that house in particular. What work were the slaves involved in at Merle Pitt? Um, primarily farming. In fact, I mentioned that a lot of them went on to live with and work for these families, not just in Merle Pitt, but elsewhere in the region. And we have later farm books um, of Marlpit that mentioned some of the names of those that were enslaved earlier. And, you know, so the same names turn up and they're doing that, those planting cycles all year round. Um, the kitchen, like I said, was a, a pretty major hub of activity there for, for everyone who lived in the house. And um, 
So a lot of the enslaved workers were, um, especially the females, were working closely in the kitchen. Um, but yeah, primarily, I would say farm work would be the biggest. Okay, and um, Alicia is asking if there, uh, do we know anything about the descendants of these slaves? Not, but that's a good question because one of the things when we first started the interpretation process was we felt it was really important to us to kind of reach out to the, um, the descendants of these enslaved communities. I, I think it's very, it's, it's very hard to research um, too much about the past lives of the enslaved just because um, obviously not much exists in the form of written records other than what I kind of showed here. But, um, you know, once you get past a certain point, and plus the naming, the names make it very hard. A lot of the names were taken from the less names of the owners. So um, kind of tracing that genealogy is very difficult. Um, occasionally you can trace it down. There are a, a few examples in Monmouth County of, of um, lines that have been traced. I don't know of any from Marpet um, in particular though, but I would love to, to find out and explore that more. Okay, um, somebody is asking approximately how much would you purchase a slave for? Uh, and, and it varies so much. If you look at the old inventories, um, which were often taken along with the side of the probate will, um, a lot of times you'll see the enslaved listed there. Um, I think, no, I'm not showing the screen anymore, but um, I'm, I forget if that, I think that first inventory of John Taylor might have listed. Uh, certainly the adult males who were capable of, of work sold for um, the most. Uh, younger children for less and females of course the, the older females tended to be the the ones who were not um as valuable to the slave uh, traders but um so the young kind of healthy males would fetch the largest prices i, I mean it's hard with the, the conversion kind of for, from the especially from the british money to in colonial times till now and so but um uh, it's a good question as, as to what they would be in today's dollars. I'm not really sure. You usually see them listed as, you know, 200 or 300 pounds or whatnot, but um, I'm not sure what that conversion would be. I don't want to, you know, yeah, make right. any wild guesses here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, when um, did the last known slave live there? Enslaved person, I should say. Um, I want to say 1830s. I mean, the manumission records that we know of, I think, the last of them were manumitted from Marpit um, around 1835, 1840. Um, and I'm not even positive that they were necessarily living at Marpit at the time, but um, certainly no later than 1840 or so. And then once you get into, 18, into the 1850s, there was virtually um, none of the tailors. They still owned the house, but it was primarily rented out to, to tenant farmers and stuff. Some of the older pictures of, of Marpet and, and Taylor Butler next door from later, the 1880s, 1890s, you can see um, black families living there. They were at the time domestic servants. So there were certainly still African Americans living in those house in at least Taylor Butler, but um, certainly no longer enslaved at those later years. Okay. Um, and did we do any kind of archaeological digs on the property outside the house? We did, yeah. Um, I mean, I I didn't, but uh, years ago I, I, there was a couple done. That. I think in ninety in the nineties, or may, maybe prior to that, um, there was digs done around the foundation, and, and they kind of pinpointed various. Um, you know, if you get into different uh, layers, you can see different years. And I know they uncovered a lot from from the nineteenth century, even going back to the eighteenth century, in terms of um, shards and ironware and glassware, but. Um, I don't remember anything, any too many specifics about the report, but you know, it's still obviously an ongoing expo exploration. I mean, it's very likely that there was no, in terms of enslavement, there, it's very likely there were no separate slave quarters like you see down south. I mean, where entire buildings were dedicated to slavery. Um, primarily in New Jersey, these the enslaved were living in the house with the families. So. Someone's asking um, where the name Marl Pit came from. Uh, it, a couple theories. One is is basically that just from the, the nearby pits of Marl, which is kind of a, a um, fertilizer. Um, but we also know that the tailors who, who lived there for many years um, in England had a, a residence that we believe was called 
um, the Marlborough estate. So it was either named after that English estate or after the uh, fertilizer, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think we'll take one more question. Um, could the slaves marry and have families? Yeah, they could. Um, I mean, again, it depends on a couple of things, the, the time period, uh, the, the relig religion of the, the slave owners, you know, what was allowed, what was not. Religion was, was often um, encouraged if, if it was, you know, Christianity or what, whatever the, the owners were, were practicing. But there are certainly records. Um, if you look at the records of, um, let's say, the old tenant church in, in Manalpa, and there's uh, quite a few records of, of baptisms, um, and there's there's definitely marriage marriage records elsewhere of, of enslaved. Sometimes they you would, you'll see a marriage of an enslaved person who marries a, a free black person. Sometimes it's to enslaved. So of course the dynamics vary, and then when there's children, it, it, it varies even more. But um, you'll see all kinds of different kind of family dynamics there. And, and it's, so yeah, but to answer the question, yeah, they. they certainly could marry. Okay. All right. One more. I lied. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that houses built in the, you know, like the 17th, 18th centuries were automatically built with the quarters over the kitchen, even if the owners did not necessarily plan to own slaves? Um, I don't know. It's a good question because a lot of times it, you see these houses like Marquette and it almost looks like two separate, you see that kitchen wing. And a lot of times people, even with Marquette, um, kind of theorize that that was built back in the 1600s. Um, and for many years, people said that Marlborough was built then. And um, when we started doing the dendrochronology or, or testing the, the wood and stuff, we, we couldn't find anything earlier than around 17, the 1700s. So, um, but if you do look at that structure, you see it many times. It's the kitchen area with that small kind of chamber loft overhead. Um, I, th I think they were probably used for other things, not just enslaved people, but um, it's very, very typical of those early uh, Dutch English houses to see that, that those, uh, those quarters. If you read um, Graham Russell Hodge's book, um, uh, Dana, what's, I'm sorry, what's the name of that? I was just looking at it. Um, uh, Slavery and Freedom in the Rural North. Rural yeah, thank North. You. yeah. Um, it's a great book and it, it, it goes into so many of these little nuances, and I think it actually mentions Holmes Hendrickson House as, as an example of the, the early architecture in, in reference to, to housing slaves in Monmouth County, so. Yeah, a couple of people have asked if, um, you know, where they can find information about slavery in Monmouth County, and I, I, you'd probably say that Graham Russell Hodges is the guy to go to for that, right? Uh, that's, I think, yeah, the, it's been a longstanding, you know, kind of dealing with Monmouth County, yeah, that's one of the, the best resources. Um, I mean, there's certainly others. There's uh, very recently, uh, you know, our colleague uh, Rick Gefkin wrote Stories of Slavery in New Jersey, which touches a lot on Monmouth County. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I, a lot of it is just also articles and, and, and research over time that may not necessarily be compiled in a book, but um, I, could be, I could put something together if people are interested in kind of whoever wants it. I'll, be happy to send it out. That'd be great. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. I don't know about you, Joe. I was nervous. We had a, an incredible amount of people sign up for this lecture. Oh, I didn't look, so. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's about want, yeah. 250 people awesome showed up tonight, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, my email, I think the first slide, my email is uh, jzamla at momhistory.org, so. If there's any questions I didn't get to, feel free to email or email Dana and it'll get to one of us. So no, you can bother Joe. That's okay. Jay Zamla at Monmouth History. That's not work. Simon Zimbella at Monmouth History. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Zemula, thank you so yeah. much. Have a great night, everybody. Sure. Thank you everyone for, for coming.